Now we are going to go straight into the Word of God, and I hope that you are ready for it. Remember, this train is called a revival train. It's been called many other things. It's been called the glory train. It's been called the gospel train. And I don't mind that at all. But it is actually a revival train. That is the message that God gave to me very clearly. So, let's go to the Word of God. I just want to pray, Father, I pray that you'd watch over the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to go straight to the Word of God. I'm going to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, and verses 17 through to 19. The book of Ezekiel, a very special book for me. It's uh, one of the callings that I had on my life. And uh, it's Ezekiel chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 17. Son of man, that's us, I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Now listen to this. This is very important. But his blood shall I require at your hand. You and I have an obligation as believers to warn the world. Then we go on to verse 19. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. In 1997, when God called me to preach the gospel, this was one of the verses that he gave to me. We have a responsibility as children of God to warn those in the world of the consequences if they continue in their wicked ways. And yes, you're quite right, sir. It will make you unpopular. It'll make you unpopular in the workplace. And uh, mother, it'll make you unpopular in the school with the children. But that is how it, wa it, it was and it always will be. Now, you, we need to ask ourselves a question. Are we going to be man pleasers or are we going to be God pleasers? And that's the choice we have to make with this particular message today. And I want to say to you today, we cannot serve two masters. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, the Lord Jesus Christ says, He who is not for me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. There is no neutral area when you come into the kingdom of God. You are either for him or you are against him. And if you say, well, I, I, you know, I'm impartial, um, I, you know, I'd rather not get involved, then you're against him. That's right. You cannot do that. You have to make up your mind. And I'm praying by the end of this message that you will make up your mind. And I will pray for you. And I am talking to believers. I know that. But folks, compromise is a deadly word. It is a dangerous place to be. Because you're sitting on a fence. And if it's a barbed wire fence, I want to tell you it's very uncomfortable. Now we want to talk about holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 says, And without holiness, no man will see God. What is holiness? Well, holiness is the end product of obedience. When you become an obedient child of God, you automatically become a holy man. The Lord says many times through the word, Sanctify yourself. Consecrate yourself. Come apart. Be separate. Yes, we're in the world, of course, but we're not part of the world. I'm not suggesting that you give up your work. I'm a farmer. Okay, I'm farming through my sons now, my families. We grow kiwi fruit, strawberries, beef cattle. We do timber contracting. We grow macadamias. We do sugar cane. But I want to say something to you right now. We are ordinary people. 
And when you say, well, I'm going to give it all up and I'm going full time for the Lord, what does that mean? I want to suggest to you that we are all in full time ministry. Paul was a tent maker. He actually goes into Corinthians and he says, I could have asked money from you, but I asked nothing from you. I earned my own keep. I never became a burden to anyone. Peter was a fisherman. We can go on and on. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And I want to say to you that not one of them was a priest. Now don't get me wrong. I have no problem with pastors and with preachers and ministers. Not at all. I have two ministers in this church on this farm. Two. And they do get paid by the congregation. And they do a fantastic job. And they are also my spiritual sons. But don't lose your identity. So if you happen to be a minor, you have got a congregation underground, second to none. When you go down in those cages, and I want to tell you, I take my hat off, I salute you. I really do. I've been down the mine only once in my life. And I said, please, Lord, never again. It's just not what I can handle. But maybe some people can't handle what I'm doing. But I want to say to you now, we need to keep in touch with the public. We need to keep in touch. This revival train is going around the world. Every week we're going to have different testimonies and different singers from different parts of the world. We're going to be praying for specific prayer requests for people who have got needs. We're going to be taking care of the children. Children are very important to me. I really want to say that to you. Children, maybe because I'm getting older, I have a real connection with children. They're so pure, they're so innocent. Yes, I know they can get up to mischief. <laughs> I remember I had five of my own and 27 adopted and a lot of others too. But children are so straightforward. I just love them. I can't walk past a child without greeting that child. Often the mom and dad have to wait until I've spoken to the children. And I just want to say to you, we really need to love each other. We need to connect with each other, especially in these times that we are living. People are losing their identity. People don't know which way to go. They don't know what to do. There's nothing that is secure. Everything is falling apart, except one thing. This book, the only thing that never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. So we really need to be watchmen to the house of God. Now I want to say something to you about a watchman. I want to paint a picture for you. Can you imagine an old medieval castle with those ramparts going right up and at night everybody comes into the castle for safety. All the vegetable farmers round about and the cattle, they all get brought into the castle and that big steel gate goes, comes down and it closes them into safety. Then they put a man, a sentry, a soldier, and he's on that top turret, right on the top. There might be a couple of them. And what they do, they watch all night to see that there are no enemy coming in. Now, I remember when I was a young preacher drawing a picture. We drew a big painting of a watchman on the wall and he was sleeping. He was sleeping. And the enemy had come to the edge of the castle. They put their ladders up and they were climbing up the ladders to go over the top and into the castle. Because everybody in the castle was trusting the watchman and they were sound asleep. What a nightmare to behold. I want to say to you, if you love Jesus Christ, as I know you do, and you say, Angus, I am a child of God. I've been born again. I've been baptized. You have a responsibility. You can't say, no, no, I don't want to get involved. You are involved. And you are a watchman on the wall. And when you see the enemy come, you take the trumpet and you blow that trumpet or that bugle. And that wakes up everybody. The enemy is coming. Get ready. That is a responsibility you have. And one thing that concerns me a lot, and I'm talking about my fellow preachers, they are sleeping on the job. They are telling people what they want to hear. And they are not telling them the truth. And the truth of the matter is, there is no one going to heaven but by the way of Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. 
people need to understand that. People need to know that God cannot undertake fornication. What is fornication? It's sleeping with somebody that's not your wife or not your husband. See this ring on my finger? I'm married to one woman. That's all. That's right. I'm an old man. She's the wife of my youth. We need to be holy people. We need to pay our tithe to the church. We need to pay our income tax to the government. That's right. We need to obey the authorities according to Romans chapter 13 verse 1. We, are, we have to do that. Not over and above what the Bible says. Not at all. But we really need to be good citizens. Now people need to understand that. You cannot, you cannot hunt with the hounds and run with the hares. So today you're going into the pub and you're going to drink and you're going to fornicate and you're going to blaspheme. And then tomorrow you're going to church and you're going to say, praise the Lord, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. You are a liar and the truth is not in you and you are a sleeping watchman because other people are looking at you and they say, well, if that man can do that, then surely it must be right. So I can also do it. We really need to lead by example. And it's not easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The Lord says we have to deny ourselves daily. Take up our cross. It's a cross is a representation of suffering and pain. And follow after the master. We really need to do that if we are going to be good watchmen into the house, unto the house of Israel. Mark chapter 8 verse 36. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And he loses his soul. Some of us are so intent on making money, of achieving achievements, worldly achievements, that we forget that this is not our home. That's what I love about the whole concept of this train. This train is moving. This train is not stationary. We are not building a home here. Our home is in heaven. Yes, we have to be responsible. We have to feed our families. We have to put a roof over their heads. We have to be good citizens. But we must understand this is not where we are staying. We are going to heaven. The Lord says, I'm going before you to make a place for you. And then I'm coming back to fetch you. Some of us are building uh, edifices and palaces here on earth. It looks like we're going to be here for a thousand years. And I've got news for you. We are not. In fact, as I'm talking to you now, I firmly believe, and I'm not a prophet, that we are living in the last days of the last days. Jesus Christ is not coming soon. He's on his way, I tell you. We really need to understand. God is not interested so much in our achievements as he is interested in us. He's interested in us. He, he says your values, your values need to be looked at. You need to have a good look at your values after this program. Sit down with your husband, with your wife with your children and say, where are we going? Our values. Where are we putting our energy and our effort? If it's all about me, self, mine, we're in trouble. I want to tell you something right now. We really need to understand that we're here to live for one another. To live for one another. The Lord wants us to measure up to this book, the Word of God. The soul of a man is more important to the Lord Jesus Christ than any of our worldly achievements. And I am talking to preachers. Doesn't matter if you've spoken to a million people, but you are living in sin. I want to tell you that when you stand before the Lord, He won't even ask about the million souls. He'll ask about your own life. He'll ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? We really need to be honorable. God is interested in courage, faith, Love, purity, self-control. He's not interested in our efforts. I really mean that, folks. You know, I want to tell you a sad story. I come from Central Africa. When I was a little boy and I was at school, there was a big uprising in the Congo. What happened was the army revolted against their officers and they started to attack the civilians, especially the missionaries. And uh, we were sent home from school and our school rooms were made available for the people coming out of the Congo. They were running a gauntlet. They would be coming in with their motor cars were full of bullet holes and the, the, most of them when they're still in their pajamas, they got up in the middle of the night and they just ran for their lives. You know? And there were some ministers that were very bitter. And I hope and pray that I'm not talking to any now. Very bitter. 
I came to Africa and I came here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and this is what's happened to me and where is God and so on and so forth. But I want to tell you something now. I question whether they were called by God. You see, if God calls you into a ministry, the outcome of the ministry is not the important point. The important point is, are you still going to do it? So if you go and you preach your whole life to 10 people, and that's all there is to it, but if that's what God's told you to do, that in itself is the reward. Do you know that Dr. David Livingston, he's probably the most well-known missionary in, on the continent of Africa. He's the only white man who's still got a white man's name left in Central Africa. Livingston. That's right. They called him the good man. He died at 60 years old. I've been to the place where they buried his heart. When he died, they opened him up. They took his heart out and they buried it underneath a tree. They said his heart remains there. That's how much they loved him. Do you know how many people he led to the Lord? Only one. A king. King Shishele of the, the Botswana people. I think it was Botswana. That's all. But it was his life. And he loved Africa like I do. The same as Robert Moffat. Loved Africa. I want to say to you, it's not about getting results. It's about obedience. And that is what makes you a holy man or woman of God. I study all the heroes of the Bible. And you know, most of them, when they die, they leave nothing behind. Nothing. George Muller, something like 120,000 children through his ministry. And when he died, he left a, a table, a chair, a bed, and I think five pounds in his account. And millions went through his hands. Millions. Why? Because his heart was for God. Now what about you today? Where's your heart? You know Eric Little? You know, you've seen that wonderful movie, Chariots of Fire. Eric Little was a Scotsman. I just had to add that. <laughs> and uh, he was the fastest runner in the whole world, in the globe. 100 meters. And you know what happened to him? Even his sister said to him once, Jenny, she said, Eric, because they came from the missionary family that was resident in China. And she was going back to China. And Eric Little was the most popular guy in the British Isles. He was the fastest man. He was a guaranteed gold medalist for the forthcoming Olympics. They knew it. It was in the bag. No one could beat him. And she got emotional one day. She said, Eric, be careful that the things of this world don't uh, cloud your vision. And he said, no, Jenny, I, I get a lump in my throat sharing this with you. He said in the movie, no, Jenny, he said, God made me fast. And I want to glorify his name through my legs. And then I'm going, I'm going to the mission field, which is exactly what he did. But you see, what happened with Eric Little was, he was running for Jesus. See, are you working for Jesus? Are you uh, nursing for Jesus? Are you teaching for Jesus? Are you preaching for Jesus? That is what holiness is. It's the motive of your heart is what is important. When he got across the English Channel in that big ship to the Olympic Games, they told him, you will be running on Sunday. He said, I don't run on Sunday. <laughs> and they put pressure on him, severe pressure. They got the future King of England, the Prince of Wales, to come into the room and say, listen, you need to be running on Sunday for your king and your country. He said, my king doesn't, says I don't run on Sunday. Can you believe that? And as a result, they took him out. And they put him in a midweek meeting for the 400 meters. He'd never trained for it. He was a 100 meter sprinter. The Americans, I remember in the movie, they said, there's no problem. He'll blow out after the first 100 meters because he doesn't know how to pace himself. Well, he did exactly that. The first hundred meters, he was miles ahead of everybody else. But you know the amazing thing is, he never blew out. He just kept going faster and faster. He got the gold medal for the 400 meters and he broke the world record. Why? Because he was obedient to God. And then you know what he did? He got on a ship and he sailed to China. And he died there at the age of 43 years old. He was ministering to the poor and the needy in that wartime situation in China. What about you today? You know, we have one, one life to live and then the judgment. What are you doing with your life? Are you, you say, yeah, but I'd like to be a preacher. I also wanted to be a preacher when I was 15 years old, but I just never had 
a university entrance qualification. And I thought, well, that was it. I didn't realize you don't have to go to university to tell people about Jesus. But the Lord took me on a journey. And maybe he's taking you on a journey. That's why I want to pray for you. He took me on a journey. He took me to Scotland. He took me to Zambia. He took me to Australia. He took me to Swaziland and he brought me to South Africa. And he taught me lessons, hard lessons. Yes, I picked pineapples. I picked 16, 18 tons of pineapples in one day. Me and two youngsters. Oh yes. I've stacked bricks. I've milked cows. I've worked in tire factories. I've been a driver. I've done everything you can think of. But that was my training ground for what I'm doing now, talking to you so I can identify with you on this train. I want to say to you, don't despise small beginnings. So you might be a clerk in the bank, or you might be a, a, a long-distance lorry driver, or you might be a housewife, or you might be a whatever. It doesn't matter. Where you are, you can be a witness for Jesus Christ. And that's where holiness comes in. It's very easy to be sanctimonious when you're in a group of people that are all praising God. Or whether you're in a Bible seminary, it's very easy to be holy. But to be holy when you're sitting in a pub with a lot of hard-working, uh, foul-mouthed people who've got good hearts, by the way, and then still stand your ground. That's what takes holiness. And that's what Eric Little did. In the face of all that opposition, he said, I will not run on a Sunday. Who do you think put uh, gasoline in those legs? Huh? A man who had never, ever trained for the 400 meters, broke the world record. Who did that? That wasn't him. That was God. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. I want to close on that verse because I really believe that in these last days we need to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20, right where we are at. So if you are an engine driver and you are driving a train, and I'm not joking, then you need to be the best engine driver that you can be for Jesus Christ. If you're a school teacher, that class is your congregation. That's exactly right. If you're a lecturer at university, you can bring Jesus into every single lecture, whether it's mathematics, science, biology, whatever it is. If you're a doctor, you can be a doctor for Jesus. You can pray for your patients. When I go to hospital to pray for the sick, I never get out of that hospital because I'm praying for this man in this bed. And before I leave, the man over there says, can you pray for me too? And I look and he's a Muslim or he's a Hindu. And I pray for him as well. And I walk out the, the ward and the, all the nurses are waiting outside. Can you please come through to the staff room? And I have a prayer meeting there. <laughs> and so it goes on. In fact, just the other day, I went down to a honey shop. That's right. Where they sell uh, beehives and all the accessories. Because I'm also a beekeeper in my spare time. I don't have too much of that. And I had the privilege of leading a young lady to Christ. Just buying some parts for my beehive. We had a wonderful meeting in there. She prayed the sinner's prayer. I told her how to read the Bible. We had a wonderful time. Be Jesus wherever you are. Because time is running out. So we're going to pray now. And I want to pray that God will give you the courage and the strength and the faith to be a holy man, a holy woman for God. Remember the best form of spiritual warfare is to lead a soul to Christ. And you don't even have to say a word sometimes. It's your lifestyle that will draw people to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for my dear friends right now. Watching this program all over the world. As this train, this revival train, is steaming up the line. We thank you this train is a holy train. This train is a clean train. This train is a pure train. And this train's destination is heaven itself. There's no reverse gear in this train. There's no U-turn. I want to pray that my friends will get on this train. And Lord, they'll start to participate. And not sit back and say that's the job of the minister or the preacher or the evangelist. But that they will get on and start to tell people what Jesus Christ means to them. Lord, I also want to pray that we'll clean up our act. Excuse the pun. 
And if we've got a problem in certain areas, Lord, even now we confess it before you and say, take it out of our hearts, Lord, by the roots, whatever it might be, so that we can be good, clean, holy vessels dedicated to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us on the Revival Train. Download the free Angus Buchan app to stay updated, watch your favorite programs, and enjoy daily devotion.